this data pointer. Um, I assume maybe this one. This is the normal pointer. This is the pointer that you can. I don't know what you need there. This pointer you can do like that. This is the data that I Okay. Okay, and here I can. All right. I will just stand here, and that's that's good. Okay, um, then thank you very much for your um, nice introduction, and I also would like to um, thank the organizers for uh, or, uh, inviting me to this very exciting meeting. So my start was a little bit bumpy because my flight um, from Frankfurt to Dresden was cancelled, and so I had to stay an extra um, a day at Frankfurt Airport. Um, but I could start watching the, the movies online, so that was actually um, pretty good. Um, so I will not talk about entry reproduction, I hope that's okay, um, but I will talk about fluctuations. Um, and in particular, um, how um, cells can control intracellular fluctuations um, using subcellular um, compartments. Okay, so to me, really one um, of the most striking features of biological systems um, is their ability to create um, extremely complicated form and function in an extremely reproducible and robust manner. Um, and so this is even um, more fascinating if we realize that um, many of the underlying physical chemical processes, and we've heard a lot about that, um, are substantially stochastic. And so this is because on small length scales, for example, such as the scale of a cell um, or an organelle, um, random fluctuations can become um, very significant. And we know by now um, that um, stochasticity in chemical reactions can lead to very large um, fluctuations in, um, in uh, cellular response, um, even in isogenic um, populations. But at the same time, um, networks of chemical reactions can coordinate highly robust um, uh, spatiotemporal programs if you think about embryonic development, um, for example. And so really the question that I have always been fascinated since I actually um, moved from engineering into biology um, is really how to reconcile the very remarkable um, robustness and precision of biological systems um, with a very large degree of stochasticity that we observe um, at the molecular level. Um, and so we, my group really wants to, to understand how biological systems solve this problem um, and what strategies they can use um, uh, to buffer and control stochasticity, but also to utilize stochasticity um, to ensure um, uh, reproducible outcomes. All right, and so um, to do so, um, my group focuses on stochastic processes um, and probability, but we also um, use concepts from statistical physics and also engineering, such as control theory um, and information theory, um, and we apply these concepts um, to concrete biological systems um, in close collaboration with our um, experimental partners, um, ranging from the molecular scale. Um, we're, for example, interested in the dynamics of um, chromatin dynamics um, and transcription up to the uh, multicellular scale, where we're, for example, interested in how um, stochastic plasticity effects um, regeneration in Hydra. And um, today I will focus on more like the, the meso scale and intermediate scale, um, where, where we are interested in understanding how um, the formation of subcellular compartments can provide robustness um, to biochemical systems. Okay, so I've mentioned to you that um, stochasticity in chemical reactions can lead to very large fluctuations um, in, in cellular responses. Um, sort of the textbook example of this is gene expression, um, where random events um, in both um, transcription and translation um, can lead to very large um, fluctuations in gene expression output. Um, and so we can see this very nicely, for example, if you look at um, uh, transcription inside, uh, inside living cells, um, where you can see mRNA transcripts as they are made at the gene locus. Um, and you can appreciate this very um, pulsatile and, and, and bursty behavior of transcription where um, pulses of transcriptional activity are followed by long silent periods. And as a consequence of this, um, gene product concentrations, um, so both RNA uh, and, and, and protein concentrations, um, can uh, fluctuate very strongly over time, but also between um, cells in an isogenic population. And so a key question in the, let's say, biological noise field um, has been how cells can sort of protect their biochemical programs against such um, gene expression noise. And so one way um, uh, which, or one potential mechanism by which they can uh, achieve this, which, which, which has also been studied quite extensively, extensively in the past, um, are genetic feedback circuits, such as a protein um, regulating its own um, transcription. Um, as it turns out, however, and this is, I can hardly point there, um, but as we know from theory, and I just want to point out this paper from the, from the Parson lab, it's really one of my all-time all favorite um, theory papers in biology. Um, we know from, from, from this study, for example, that um, the, that the efficiency of um, genetic feedback regulation is in cells very strongly limited due to kinetic constraints, and that being precise um, through genetic feedback control would in fact be very costly um, for the cell. Um, and this is in fact um, supported also by um, system-wide single-cell studies, um, which show that um, gene expression or protein concentration noise um, is indeed very noisy across the whole 
um, proteome. So just to explain this plot here, um, what you see here, each dot here corresponds to one protein species. That's not real data, that's a cartoon, but each dot is one protein species. And we quantify noise, which is defined here as the coefficient of variation squared. So uh, variance divided by mean squared. It gives you a percent variation, if you want, uh, relative to the mean. Um, over mean expression level, and what we see then is, is that noise initially decreases with average expression level, but then saturates um, at a level which is still fairly high, typically in the range of, let's say, 20 to 40 percent relative variation, um, depending on the um, uh, organism and condition um, we are looking at. Um, and, and this together, in fact, shows that um, the, the precision at which uh, cells control protein amounts through genetic circuitry is, in fact, um, quite limited. So another way um, by which cells can control um, uh, fluctuations um, is, is sequestration. And so the idea here is, is that you put a certain fraction of the molecules into a sequestered state. So if you have too much, for example, you put them uh, into a sequestered state. And if you have too little, you take them out again. And as such, um, the idea is that you can then um, uh, basically um, sort of stabilize or keep the, the, the soluble fraction uh, within narrow ranges. Um, and uh, there are, in fact, um, a couple of manifestations um, of such sequestration-based um, uh, noise suppression mechanisms that, that have been described in the literature. Um, one example is, for example, nuclear uh, retention, where um, delayed export of transcripts from the nucleus leads to um, reduced copy number fluctuations um, in the cytoplasm. Um, or um, protein clusters, which form um, at the membrane um, of fission yeast to stabilize um, uh, protein and concentration gradients um, inside uh, the cell, um, or um, uh, decoys, which are um, non-functional binding sites of the DNA, which can sequester away um, transcription factors to reduce um, fluctuations. Um, so now another class of sequestration um, compartments, if you want, are um, membraneless organelles, and it has been um, suggested that those could, in fact, um, serve as a mechanism to reduce um, uh, fluctuations. And so. Um, this idea is really based on the very, um, let's say, um, uh, on, the, on the very characteristic thermodynamic behavior of a phase separating system, where a protein, for example, as soon as it um, uh, reaches a certain, th a certain threshold concentration, um, demixes into two phases, so one phase, one condensed phase with higher concentration, and then a second um, uh, phase surrounding it, for example, um, with lower concentration. And the important part is that these con the concentrations inside and outside are thermodynamically constrained, um, as can be described um, by a phase diagram, for example. Um, and importantly, if now, for example, and the total concentration changes, then we expect the compartment to change its size until the equilibrium concentrations um, are, are, are reached again. And if, if we drop uh, the concentration, the compartment shrinks, um, and so forth. OK, and so this very um, simple idea um, suggests that um, phase-separated condensates could serve as sort of storage reservoirs in cells, um, which maintain um, concentrations within um, narrow ranges. So in other words, um, they could absorb fluctuations by dynamically um, changing their size. Um, however, if this um, a very simple um, a picture really holds inside the um, very complex environment of the cell, it's of course not immediately clear. Um, first, um, this whole idea is based on the equilibrium physics of, of, of phase separation, and cells are inherently out of equilibrium, for example, because material is produced um, and degraded. Um, and secondly, of course, intracellular compartments can be extremely complex um, and involve many different components and interactions, which may further complicate um, this simple picture. Okay, so in order to um, ad address this question, to understand um, if and under what conditions um, phase separated condensates can suppress noise, um, we first took a theoretical approach um, to see how far we can get with, this, um, uh, with the physics of phase separation in this context and then test this inside um, uh, living cells. And before I proceed, um, I want to introduce my uh, um, collaborators on this project, in particular um, Adam Clusin um, and Florian Orch, who really did um, most of the work that I'll, I'll be showing to you. Okay, so from a theoretical um, uh, point of view, the key goal here was to come up with a theory um, that bridges between the active production and turnover um, of molecular material and um, uh, the formation of mesoscale compartments um, on the other side. And so what I will do now is I will first discuss these two parts um, in isolation and then show how we can um, bring them together. Okay, so um, uh, concentration fluctuations are um, usually... Um, are usually described um, using what I would call generalized birth and death processes, which essentially capture uh, different kinetic um, steps um, in the central dogma, transcription factor binding and promoter switching, transcription, uh, translation, and so forth. Um, and in order to not make too many particular assumptions um, right now, what I want to do for this talk is to introduce essentially a generic birth and death process from the viewpoint um, of a protein, where I basically make protein and degrade them, um, but I introduce a generic um, uh, protein synthesis rate R of T, 
um, which I don't really specify further. The only thing I assume here is, is that it's stationary and that it has a um, finite stationary mean and an auto covariance function kappa. So that's how, how I call the auto covariance uh, function. And the advantage of this approach here is, is that we can then um, calculate um, stationary fluctuations of protein concentration in closed form, in a very generic um, form. It's not too important what the individual terms mean here, but um, the first term here is essentially a Poissonian term, which actually scales um, inversely with average abundance, and the second one factors in essentially all the fluctuations or statistics um, from the upstream part. Here, just as a note, so kappa hat here is um, the Laplace transform of the autocorrelation functions, it's something like a, or similar to a power spectral density. Um, but what is important here is that this um, very simple model um, captures sort of the characteristic um, inverse scaling of, of concentration noise with average concentration that we've also seen um, in, in the experimental data as shown um, before. And so maybe just as a remark, so the goal here is not to be biologically precise or accurate, but really to have a minimal but yet general enough model to capture um, concentration fluctuations. Okay. I will now forget about for a moment um, about the protein concentration um, part um, and focus exclusively on the process um, of condensate formation. So what that means is that we now consider um, a box with a certain number of molecules, which I call N, and this is now a conserved quantity, so it does not fluctuate. Um, and then this protein can partition into a droplet, a compartment, um, and I call um, the number of molecules outside the compartment N plus and the number of molecules inside the compartment is N minus, and then I introduce corresponding volume fractions, um, which are really just um, normalized concentrations, so concentration times um, molecular volume, and I will refer to them um, as concentration in the following. Okay, so here are a couple of more detail. What we assume here for simplicity is um, basically a, a spherical droplet, um, which is homogeneous, so we neglect concentration gradients, um, which is surrounded um, by a dilute phase with lower concentration. And for simplicity, because we focus on fluctuations outside of the compartment, um, we neglect density fluctuations inside the compartment. And so that's um, because those are expected to have little influence on outside fluctuations, um, but they reduce one degree of freedom and make our life a little bit easier. Okay, we can then um, characterize the system by a free energy, which in essence consists um, of three parts, um, one corresponding to the, uh, the individual phases, droplet dilute phase, plus an uh, additional term corresponding to the surface um, tension between, uh, uh, because of the interface. Um, and so the explicit expression looks um, a little bit bulky, but it, it nicely illustrates sort of the, um, the competition between um, molecular interactions, and then on the other hand, sort of the entropy of mixing that we get here, um, and the surface tension. So those two play in one team and fight against um, the interactions. And then, yes. yeah. This means the droplet is just an aggregation. Isn't there is no a membrane or something like no that? No membrane. No membrane. Membraneless. Exactly. Um, right. And then, as soon as I have enough molecules in the system, this first part will outcompete the other two parts, and then we will form um, a stable uh, droplet. Um, okay, and from this um, uh, free energy, we can then calculate equilibrium statistics. Um, and if we do that, so I just show this as um, uh, for, for, for illustration, um, then we see pretty much what we, what we would expect from a simple binary phase separating system. Um, so as soon as the system um, exceeds a certain uh, threshold concentration, we form um, compartment, um, and then we get approximately Poissonian um, fluctuations around um, this um, threshold. But what, what, of course, what we are really interested in here is not when phi is conserved, as is the case now, but we now want to understand what happens if phi actually fluctuates. Okay, and to do that, um, we actually go back um, to um, our kinetic model that I've introduced before and extend it to the case um, where molecules can um, partition into a compartment once um, they are made. And for that, um, we introduce two additional um, exchange events or ex exchange reactions um, with rates W in and W out. Um, and we want these um, exchange reactions to be um, uh, to be consistent with the thermodynamics that we have discussed before. And to do that, we um, uh, require them to, to satisfy detailed balance, which essentially relates the ratio of the two rates to the um, free energy change associated with that move. And the, the, the F here is the free energy that I've introduced um, to you before. And if we now, for example, um, fix one of the two rates, for example, by considering um, a diffusion-limited condensation rate, and we also know um, the corresponding reverse rate. And the um, uh, dynamics of the system, of this, uh, the non-equilibrium dynamics of the system can then be described um, by a master equation, which is a little bit bulky, but in essence it consists of two parts. So one which essentially captures um, sort of the, the protein expression kinetics, and then a second part um, which captures the exchange of material between the two phases. So the second part um, conserves mass. 
Okay, so this is a very nonlinear mass equation, so we cannot solve it um, analytically, but only um, numerically. Um, however, I want to show you also one interesting um, uh, limit where we can actually find an analytical solution to that equation, and that's the limit where we have um, small droplets. So when the droplet volume is small in comparison to the total volume, and in the limit where surface tensions become very small. And in this case, you can actually show, and I'm not going into detail, but what happens then is that the exchange events, or the exchange rates become effectively linear, where the in rate is given by essentially a diffusion rate times n plus, n plus was the number of molecules outside, um, and the out rate becomes effectively constant. So again, KD, so the diffusion rate, times a constant, and this constant n star um, can be understood as the threshold particle number, so the amount of particles you want to have in the system in order to form, uh, at, at least in order to form a stable um, compartment. And from this we can then um, calculate um, closed form um, statistics, so we get a relation for the average concentration that relates the concentration outside the droplet to the total concentration, as well as the fluctuations in the total concentration and fluctuations in the dilute phase. Okay, and so those two are the important uh, quantities that we would like to compare to each other to understand how fluctuations are affected um, by phase coexistence. Okay, so here's just essentially the same plot that I was showing before. Um, the main difference here is now that phi is also a, sto is a stochastic degree of freedom, so that's no longer conserved. Um, there's one remark I want to make here. I'm plotting here also the average concentration relationship, so that's average phi plus dilute phase concentration as a function of average phi. And one interesting um, qualitative difference is, is that this um, uh, concentration relationship is now no longer constant as was the case for the equilibrium situation, but now um, shows in, in, in fact the slope. So it's not too important for this talk, but it's some sort of signature of, uh, um, of, of, of the non-equilibrium behavior of the system. And from our analytical approximation, we also know that um, the slope of this line is approximately given by K2. Um, over KD plus K2, so it relates the half-life of the protein to the diffusion rate, um, which makes sense if diffusion is very fast to relax instantaneously and you um, recover um, sort of the equilibrium um, solution in this case. What we really focus about here is basically, and it's hardly visible here, are the ellipses around one particular average point here. So we want to compare fluctuations in this direction um, and fluctuations in this direction. That's what I um, want to do in the next um, slide. Um, so here I really just want to summarize the main um, results that come out of, of this model. I'm again plotting noise um, over mean total concentration. Um, and the green line here is, uh, is, is essentially um, the noise plotted here. And what we see here is again um, this characteristic inverse relationship where noise initially decreases with average concentration but then plateaus. And in the absence of a condensate it would not go down any further. But as soon as um, we hit now the, the threshold concentration um, compartments begin to form, and then um, you see a quite dramatic uh, drop of concentration variability um, in this case. Um, and in fact, if, again, until it reaches a certain um, plateau, and we can then use um, um, a theorem um, uh, called the law of total variance, which is a simple variance decomposition, to show that within this uh, limit here, um, all the remaining noise um, is in fact due to phase separation, so that's basically the price you have to pay to make um, molecules form a compartment, whereas all the noise that comes from upstream, so everything from promoter switching, um, transcriptional noise, um, is essentially um, uh, suppressed, so this will go to zero in this, uh, in, in, in this regime. Um, okay, and so what, I, uh, what I'm showing you here, so the green line here, um, actually corresponds to the case where um, phase separation is much faster on the time scale of protein expression. Um, and so we now wanted to know what happens if these time scales are no longer strictly separate but actually uh, uh, approach each other. And so we um, define two relevant time scales or inverse time scales here. Again, um, the diffusion um, rate and K2, the protein degradation rate. Um, and then we see that um, as soon as this uh, number is no longer um, zero, um, uh, we see somehow this, this qualitative difference where we first, uh, noise is first um, decreased, but then begins to increase again for higher expression levels. Okay, and this is because for high expression levels, um, diffusion at some point is not fast enough anymore to really um, effectively bring all the molecules inside the compartment. Um, we can see this also a little bit better if we look at our analytical approximation again, um, where essentially we get two contributions here. Again, the first one is essentially a Poissonian uh, term, so that scales inversely with average concentration, so that will uh, first go down, but then we get a second term um, which um, increases with K1, and K1 is the parameter that we increase if we want to increase concentration, um, and so we get a decreasing and an increasing function, you add them up together, and then you get essentially this um, minimum at a certain point. 
Okay, but in summary, this, um, this analysis um, predicts that as, as, as long as sort of um, phase separation is fast on the time scale um, of protein turnover, um, noise should be effectively reduced um, by, um, uh, by condensate. Okay, and so we next wanted to test this um, experimentally, and we therefore collaborated with the lab of Tony Hyman, in particular um, Adam Closin. By the way, how am I doing with time? Is it? Okay, good. Um, uh, right, and so what, what Adam did was that he um, used a variant um, of the phase separating protein DDX4, so that's a heli case, and he essentially used the IDR um, of that protein and boosted to a YFB, and so you can make this um, protein phase separate um, inside the cell, and they make nice compartments inside the nucleus, um, and then you can use, yeah, could use transient transfection uh, to measure concentrations um, uh, total concentrations and dilute phase concentrations for a very broad range um, of expression levels. And what you can notice here also, if you, ma if you imagine a line here, then you also see a certain slope, which is at least consistent um, with what um, we have seen in, the, uh, in one of the previous plots. And if you now actually um, look at the fluctuations in the system, so if you measure um, noise for different expression levels um, along, along this line, then we see a very similar trend where we first uh, noise indeed decreases as soon as compartments form, um, but then begins to increase again. If you compare this um, to our theory, that's at least qualitatively in, in, in a somewhat reasonable agreement, whereas the theory um, sort of underestimates noise in the dilute phase, which may be because we're uh, missing certain additional uh, sources of variability, which are not captured um, in this very simple model. Okay, I just want to show you um, also um, a brief movie here, um, which I think uh, illustrates the concept quite nicely. Um, what we are doing here is that we make use of the fact that um, many membraneless organelles um, dissolve during mitosis. Um, and so what you will see here is that uh, so we basically track cells through mitosis and then out again. Um, and then the compartments will go away and that gives us sort of a, a control scenario where we can measure noise in the presence and absence of condensates and, and then compare them. Um, and if we do that, then um, you see now how cells progress. Um, cells round up, compartments go away very quickly, and now you see um, the variability that is there in total protein concentration. If you quantify this, then you, get, then you also see that the spread of this distribution is, is much broader than before. Um, if cells exit mitosis again, the compartments form again very quickly, and you again um, lead to this buffered, um, reduced noise um, state. Okay, so the results that I've shown you so far, um, uh, the experimental results um, are from an engineered um, or synthetic condensate um, using overexpression. Um, and so we also wanted to test um, this idea or concept under physiological concentration of an endogenous condensate. And to do that, um, we measured concentrations of MPM1 nucleophosmine, and that's a key component um, of the nucleolus. Um, and we did, we did the same trick as before, um, where we essentially measured um, MPM1 during mitosis, so when the nucleolus is absent, and compared it to a nucleoplasmic um, MPM1 in the presence uh, that coexists with the nucleolus. Um, and if we do that, you see here nucleoli forming, um, then we obtain something similar as before. We can plot total intensity over um, dilute phase intensity. And we can also quantify noise here, and again you see that the distribution the variability over, over protein concentrations is again quite strongly reduced in the presence um, of these condensates. Okay, um, and so one, um, and this is now a really working progress, but one um, sort of obvious next question is what happens inside um, the compartments, especially if you think about the nucleolus where ribosomes are made. Um, and so this is what Akshay, a new student um, in, in, in my group and, and Tony's group is now um, working on. So what he does is he measures um, concentrations um, of multiple simultaneously labeled proteins um, uh, inside living cells, inside the nucleolus, also outside, um, and, then, um, uh, and then measures noise in these individual components, but also co-variations uh, among them. And this is really just some preliminary data, but what he found is that also in the dense phase, so also in the nucleolus, which is somewhat expected, um, you also get a quite, quite significant reduction um, of noise. Um, and we are, in the future we want, um, basically we have extended um, uh, the, the theory that I've, I've talked to you about uh, to, to multi-component systems, um, which I didn't talk about today, but the goal is then to bring this, uh, these two worlds together um, to understand sort of the constraints um, of, of noise reduction in an endogenous system. 
Good. Um, with this, I would actually like to conclude. Um, so what I've shown you was um, uh, is that um, phase-separated condensates um, suppress cellular noise, and the reason why that happens is, is that they serve as sort of um, sort of um, storage compartments which can um, have buffer fluctuations in in total concentration. Um, I've also shown you that this depends critically on on, on time scales of proton diffusion and turnover. Um, so we expect this to be. Um, uh, particularly effective for um, long-lived and, and fast diffusing proteins. Um, I've also shown you that sort of the active production and turnover leads to qualitative differences um, when compared to equilibrium theory. In this particular case, we've seen, for example, that the binodal points um, are no longer reached as soon as you put a flux um, uh, through, through the system, um, which also has important um, uh, consequences for uh, when, you, when you measure, for example, phase diagrams inside living cells. Um, and maybe just to go back um, uh, where, I, where I started, um, so I've mentioned to you before that um, uh, negative feedback is a way to control, um, uh, control noise or suppress noise. Um, and so I was originally trained in engineering and in controlled engineering we would say that negative feedback is even a necessity to achieve robustness in the presence um, of disturbances. Um, and so the system that I've shown you is clearly robust um, in terms of fluctuations or perturbations, um, but we don't see any obvious feedback. But um, actually if you look at that system from a more um, control theoretical point of view, I don't have time to, to show this in particular, but then you realize that um, the droplet itself um, mediates negative feedback, and so it acts um, as a feedback controller that maintains or wants to maintain concentrations that are thermodynamically set, uh, set, set point, um, so to say. And the difference to, let's say, genetic feedback circuits here is that um, uh, it, it, it happens, so to say, entirely post-translation uh, um, and really emerges as a collective property um, of, of many interacting um, uh, proteins. And in summary, I think this shows um, that sort of the mesoscale organization of molecules um, can give rise to very interesting um, functioning behaviors and also that this can be predicted um, from relatively simple um, thermodynamic um, principles. Good, okay, this I forgot to mention, but um, we, will foc we are actually working on this particular problem to understand um, feedback control in, uh, in, 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 uh, in condensates when you have basically coexisting phases coupled to additional reaction cycles and what sort of the dynamic consequences of that are um, in collaboration um, uh, with Christoph Weber and Anne is a student um, in my uh, group. Okay, with this I would like to thank my um, uh, lab um, and my uh, collaborators and of course you for your attention. Thank you, Christoph. So we we'll have time for questions. Sahab is there or not? <laughs> we have two questions from students, I guess. Um, sorry if I missed it, but is from the model, is there an intuitive explanation of why the the coefficient of variation plateaus? That, um, that makes sense biologically as well? You mean um, already without any co condensate? Yep. Um, yeah, that's what people usually call the extrinsic noise limit. And it's basically because you have a, a part of the fluctuations, and I can maybe go back to it, um, which does not scale away uh, with increasing average. And that's this part here in this particular case. So you have one term here which is really sort of Poissonian, so that you can just, by system size arguments, you can just say it will go away. Uh, but then there is one part which does not scale um, in that sense. So that, that plateau has no biological function, it just arises out of the physics I mean, people, side? Um, in, 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 the, in the noise field, in the other plot that I've shown you in the system by uh, studies, people call this really extrinsic noise floor, but extrinsic noise is not very well defined. It basically is everything that is not part of the gene expression circuit that you're looking at. So it's additional heterogeneity that causes this plateau, basically. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. Um, so, um, I wanted to ask if you have considered of it, it would be useful to consider because many times this condensate has also properties such as viscoelasticity. Mm -hmm. So, if it would be, yeah, if have you, if you considered this, we, we we have have not at all. But I completely agree with you that that there are many important um, uh, properties of condensates that that could be factored in. In fact, here we really just. Um, use a very simple, simple approach here. Um, I would even say, you know, if a condensate ages, for example, and hardens or something, I think this property will go away. In, in, in fact, that's what I would naively predict. But yeah. Yeah. thank you. Questions? Uh, Joe. Uh, beautiful talk. 
My question is that the, um, I mean, the buffering, the buffering of the noise is the cytoplasmic, you know, is the, is the, the noise in the, you know, in the dilute compartment. And um, so, that's, so that's really assuming that the, you know, that the molecules have their function in the dilute compartment and that the, that the you know, the, the high concentration department, you know, the condensate is really more, more of a storage Particles? Is that, what, is that the way to think about what's So, so, what so that was the most, most of the talk, but in, in the very end, the, the outlook, there we, we look really specifically inside the nucleolus, uh, because, you know, it's conceivable that you want to have a precise microenvironment there, and that's what Aksha is now um, uh, looking into. So especially in the nucleolus, mm -hmm. so the, 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 the first experiment that I was showing was really just proof of principle, just to see whether such a multi-component system does it, but now in terms of biological relevance, yeah. um, in this particular component, we do want to go into the nucleus. Okay. But can you see, I mean, it, do you have in mind any, a biological example where it would be good to buffer the cytoplasmic component? I mean, I mean that would be useful yeah. by putting it into a condensate. No, I mean, is there an argument that, I mean, yeah. is there a system that you're thinking about that would There's be There's a like few, I have a, one very specific system in mind, which is from the, um, I for, for, forgot the name now, but it's a, a lab in Texas, and they don't work, they're not from the condensate field, but they work on cell division, and they have shown, they've they have come across a condensate, which essentially sequ sequesters a factor called PAM1, um, uh, and that the condensate is sort of initiated by long non-coding RNAs anyway, but you have to sequester away material during mitosis, and both too high and two levels have disease phenotypes. And so they already have sh shown that, but the, the, the link to noise has not, not been made. But that's the system that I would, would look at. <laughs> to follow up uh, maybe um, on, on, on Joe's question, right? So, so this mechanism works for both the protein outside of the droplet and for the protein that sits inside of the droplet, right? You just capitalize on the idea that at phase coexistence, these densities are constant, um, right? Irrespective of the total concentration. Yeah, not, not quite constant, but yeah. yeah but yeah. to a very good approximation, yeah. just given by the coexisting mm -hmm. densities. Mm -hmm. um, but of course then for this mechanism to work, right? The target process, the, the, the process that this protein of interest has to regulate, that should then reside either inside of the droplet or outside of the droplet. You do not want this droplet sort of to wander around yeah. or that your target process of interest is sometimes inside the droplet where the concentration is high and then outside the droplet where it is low, right? Because then you get very large fluctuations. So right. do you have any... A ideas, absolutely. Ideas. I mean, it's, it's, it's under the premise that you sort of have a, a functional separation um, between the, the two different phases. Um, in nucleolus, one could make yeah. the argument, but there are other yeah. examples. And so the idea is then that, that sort of, a, you know, reactions happen sort of inside the compartment. Yeah. And if, if reactions are concentration dependent, um, then, then sort of downstream events um, uh, sh should happen more robustly. This is sort of evidence that, for example, transcription factors, that you have sort of droplets of transcription factors around the promoter, for example? Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah? I mean, I, I have not looked into transcriptional uh, condensates at all. Um, there it's also because one thing that is clear, you know, reduction of noise always comes at a cost of reducing sensitivity. And for transcription factors, we know they encode information about the environment. And so it, <laughs> that there's a bit of a trade-off between how much information can you trans transmit mm -hmm. to the nucleus as opposed to how robustly can you establish, uh, let's say, a, a microenvironment, which is an interesting trade-off, I think. Yeah. But, um, Yeah, that was very interesting. I have a conceptual question about how to think about the noise itself, because um, noisy gene expression need not necessarily have impact on activity of the number of proteins that are involved in a specific process. So how do we um, sort of decouple between noise in the total numbers of proteins you see, for example, versus the number of active molecules you would need for a process to occur? Yeah, so by, by active you mean really chemically modified in order to be to be active. Yeah, so this would be one step further down further down the road. Um, I mean, in, in this case, so, so we do not account for this in our in, in our theory. We just make molecules and we just say the molecule is active as it comes out. But of course, if you would have an additional step in between, like post-translation or I don't know phosphorylation, whatever, um, then I mean you could take this into account. But then this will somehow affect noise. But it depends on the details. Um, yeah, so I can't but, give you a very good answer. <laughs> but just to just follow up then, um, when you say noise, it's, it's noise in just the total number of 
molecules, but not necessarily noise in terms of activity because it's possible, you know, you need 100 molecules of, to get a particular action carried out in the cell. Yeah, and so absolutely. No, I mean, I can define noise also in the fraction of active molecules. The question is what can I measure in the, in the end also. Um, so if I can see the active molecules, then, then of course that, that's a very natural thing to do. If you don't have any, yeah, but, but otherwise you, you just see total copy number um, uh, fluctuations in the end. Yeah. Thank you. I have a question myself, that um, uh, in, in the typical models of uh, condensation, and uh, the, the, the density of the dilute phase depends on the interaction strength between the molecules. Yeah. So the, the interaction strength, I guess, is given by the chemistry. So how can the, um, how can the cell tune the concentration of the dilute phase? It's I mean, it's, it's, it's sequence in the end. Or, re or even regulate, because at some stages of, of, of you, you will need another concentration. So how can you tune and regulate the concentration? I mean, one thing that, that you've seen, I mean, there are two answers maybe. One, one thing that you've seen is that in the, in, in, in the mitosis movies, you know, they, they, they can, you know, uh, uh, due to kinase activity, for example, um, can make compartments go away. So they can, they can modify interactions um, be, be between, um, between molecules on the fly, but otherwise it's really sort of a sequence um, uh, thing. So you can ev evolutionarily tune um, how strong the interactions are and who, okay. who wants uh, look, what you can tune is the total density, no? And then this changes. I think what you tune is interactions, and then everything else emerges from, from interactions. That's how, how I would think about it. So. Any further question? Okay. So if not, let's thank Christoph again. <laughs> and all the speakers of the session. And I don't know if uh, we have any announcement or we have the excursion, no?